Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CFA, TFOC, FATF, is a regional organization of 25 states which have agreed to implement common countermeasures to address money laundering, terrorist financing, and proliferation financing. And basically, this comes out of it. This, the countermeasures they're referring to there are the 40 standards, right, which are implemented by the FATF. Now, the FATF is the Financial Action Task Force. This was an organization that originated in 1989. Initially, its mandate was drug trafficking, but it has been extended significantly since then to incorporate um, money laundering, um, financing, terrorist financing, and also proliferation financing. Proliferation financing is the most recent part that has been added to cover in the standards. That was added in 2012, which was the last time the standards were revised um, in a major way. And proliferation financing is basically referring to financing of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Okay, um, the CFATF is what is known as an FSRB. And what you would find when you are involved in the EML CFT area, you would come across a lot of acronyms, right? FSRBs, DNFPPs. CDD, EC, EDD, right? You have VESPs, TCSPs, it's legion, right? This FSRB stands for FATF style regional bodies. And as its name implies, the CFATF is basically what you would call a Caribbean version of the FATF. And basically, the main function of it, right, is to achieve the main job is to achieve effective implementation and compliance with the 40 FATF recommendations against money laundering, terrorist financing, and financing and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The main way it does this is through conducting mutual evaluations of its members. And basically the mutual evaluation is a process where assessors visit the country and using information that is provided by the country determines or assesses the level of compliance and effective implementation of the 40 recommendations by its members. And this is done by using what is called the FETF methodology. Now the FETF methodology itself is available on the FETF website. You can go to the website and download it if you want to be interested, if you want to go into greater detail in it. And basically what the methodology does it is a method of assessing compliance in two main areas. We have what is known as the technical compliance area, which looks strictly at the measures in place to comply with the requirements of the 40 recommendations. So that's the technical aspect, technical compliance aspect. But also the new emphasis on the methodology itself coming into the fourth round is effectiveness. There were, two, there were three previous rounds of evaluations, and basically those, mutual, those rounds of evaluations were looking at what was called the technical aspect of the recommendations. In other words, they were looking to ensure if measures were put in place, be it within the legal framework or the institutional framework of the country to comply with the standards. So that was one way of looking at it. But since we have had three rounds, the FATF was of the view that the majority of countries would already have those measures already in place. So what we are going to look at right now is look at effectiveness. In other words, you have these measures in place. How well are they being implemented? What are the outcomes coming from the having put in place these measures? And that's basically what the mutual evaluation looks at. And the reason I am highlighting both of those areas is because the NRA feeds in directly from both aspects of that mutual evaluation. And as was mentioned before, recommendation one. Recommendation one in the criteria, in the, met rather in the methodology, each recommendation is broken down into its component parts. And if you go to the methodology, you will see, for instance, recommendation one, I think, has 12 component parts. But you will see here, criteria 1.1. Country should identify and assess the MLT of risk for the country. 1.2, countries should designate an authority or mechanism to coordinate actions to assess risk. 1.3, countries should keep the risk assessments up to date, as was mentioned before in the previous um, presentation that we had. The risk assessments themselves, the NRA, is not something that we do 
as a one-off. It's something that is a continuous and gradual activity. GEBE has been faithfully serving the communities of St. Martin, powering your home and our economy. Come rain or shine, our qualified team of professionals are working hard 24 hours a day to provide you and your family with safe, reliable electricity and water. We use the latest technologies and test our products daily to maintain the highest international standards. Our friendly staff is always there to assist you, whether in person, over the phone, or online. We are committed to constantly improving our products and services, making them more efficient, effective, and environmentally friendly to serve you better today and our next generation of clients tomorrow. GEBE, -E, powering a brighter future. Our friend Mega Wadi is here with tips to save you energy. One, turn your air code temperature up. Two, use a ceiling fan instead. Three, buy energy saving products. Save some green with NVGEBE. -E. While out campaigning for the upcoming elections on January 9, 2020, many persons have been asking me to explain more about the amendment which I submitted into Parliament on December 4, 2019. The amendment which I submitted, the initiative which I took, has to do with changing the Constitution, changing Article 59 in order to stop the frequent fall of government which has us going back to the polls over and over. One of the things that I also explained to the, per, to the people is that changing Article 59 will also stop the ship jumping a bit. Why? Because the ship jumper will not have the power that the ship jumper have at this moment. When somebody jumps ship and the quorum drop below eight, in this case, we will ask the government to wait until about 30 days to see if the parliament can make back a quorum. Now, the ship jumper would have disturbed the quorum, but when you wait 30 days and parliament can put back a quorum, they can put back a majority, then we would not be going into election. So, amending Article 59 will also stop the amount of ship jumping, in my opinion, and also stop the amount of frequent elections that we are having all the time. I am Rudolph Samuel, your number six candidate on the National Alliance slate. I am asking you for your support and your vote in the upcoming parliamentary elections on January 9th, 2020. We are nearing the peak of our tourist season, which are January and February. These are the months when many tourists from the United States of America come to the Caribbean. And of course, St. Martin is not exempted. 
during my my campaign, I would say, I visited a few homes, spoke to a couple of persons, and again, the issue of the Seattle Town contract came to the forefront. I met some single mothers, uh, and I'm sure there are many others, who were laid off, and that is why I entitled my article, Laid Off for the Season. Uh, what happened? When I asked them why were they laid off, because two were laid off in November, and there's one who will be laid off in the next two weeks, to be exact, on the 9th of January, election day. And when I asked what were the reasons, what was said to me, uh, they were told that a contract expired and therefore they would not be renewed. I would have thought, I would have heard, I had problems with my employee, uh, my colleague had problems with the employer, uh, things were tough in the business therefore, expenses were high and the business was not making money, then I could have understood why they were being sent home. But no, they were just told, um, they are sorry, um, your contract expires and it will not be renewed. What really made me um, realize again is that on St. Martin, we are still having what you call the abuse of the short term contract. This particular mother, who I'm going to uh, highlight, she started working for this particular company in July 2018. She was given a six month contract. In the summer of, this, of said year, instead of calling her in, they did not do so. What they did was automatically allow it to roll over, I would say. In other words, they allowed it to go from July. Uh, from December 2018 until July 2019. Again, she was not called, she was not called it or told anything. Lo and behold, December 2019 of this year, she was called and told um, it is nothing personal, but as of January the 9th, 2020, your contract will not be renewed. Now, what does this mean? And this is why I keep repeating myself all the time. The contract, the short-term contract, is actually needed for seasonal workers and also persons who are on vacation or somebody goes home sick or for vocational training. But what is happening on St. Martin, it is being abused because these employees don't have these, don't want to have these persons on a permanent basis. Now, I did a bit of, bit of a research and I found out that Spain, Germany, Italy, Portugal, the Netherlands, um, Greece, Belgium, all those countries have these short-term contracts. And I can understand this, but you cannot compare these countries with St. Martin. As a matter of fact, I understood right now that as of January 1st, 2020, the Netherlands are changing their labor laws also. Apparently, it has to do with the fact that they are realizing that short-term contracts are not helping the economy. Persons are spending less because they're not sure that they have a job tomorrow. So I'm saying to us in St. Martin, we cannot use the example of big countries on this small island. I can go back to the day when I worked at Mullet Bay, which is a long term ago, of course. There was nothing, no such thing called a short term contract. You came on trial basis and you were hired. And I'm saying that we should rethink, we look at that, that short term contract. As a matter of fact, in September of this year, there was a meeting held in Parliament to discuss the short term contract, its abuse, and to make amendments to it. I understood, because I'm not in Parliament anymore, that the law was passed sometime in September. But my question is, where is it? Where has it been promulgated or established? Because I understood that instead of sending home the person, um, instead of giving them three consecutive contracts that will expire after that, that can go until 36 months, they took it from 36 months to 24 months. Now I'm saying, from 2011, I was pursuing that law. 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 15. There are ministers of, of labor who I, 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 I informed and said, look, where is the contract? Where is the document? Where are the changes? What is happening to it? Let me be clear, be very clear, because I'm sure there are some employers who are getting the jitters, but the fact is, I'm talking about those who are abused in the contract. I'm not saying it's not needed, but not in the manner which is being used today. Now we have this mother now, who just got an apartment for herself and three children, who was feeling comfortable because things were working out well, to be told now, during the season, the peak season, on St. Martin, that she will be sent home as of January 9, 2020. Where is government responsibility? The Constitution is very clear on that. Government has to take care of those who are not working, but at the same time now, it is also the responsibility of the employer. And why did I mention the Netherlands? And apparently they are making it difficult now for persons who are, work for employers who are abusing persons working on a short-term contract to lay them off. As a matter of fact, I am busy looking at the law, which was sent down um, email to me, where they say, if you're permanent and you are laid off, 75% of your salary has to be paid by government. 
But of course, where does government get those funds from? From the employer. And secondly, I would say this. If the employer sends you home, and there's no basis for, for instance, like business is going bad, or they don't need you anymore because of um, how things are not working out in their favor, then that should be proven. You see, one of the issues are the short-term contract was brought into force, or the flexibility of it was brought into force on St. Martin in about 20 years or so ago, because why? Employers were saying it is difficult to send home someone. The rules were stringent, you had to deal with the director of labor, you had to go through the courts. So in order to make things similar for the employers, go and put the laws in place to get them more free hand, but what they are doing today is abusing it. So I am saying, to, I am saying this to you, that it is time to revisit the short-term contract. Changes have to be made in it where to deal as much as possible with the abuse and to put the onus also on employers who are using this as a means not to have permanent employees. So I'm saying to you that this is important because otherwise the economy of St. Martin will continue to suffer. Now, I, I read in the news where they said things are going good in St. Martin. I'm saying, yes, for who? Who is benefiting? And there is the key, because if I can send home one employee, replace it with another one, send him home afterwards, another one, without the necessary responsibility, it means that that person, once they're unemployed, they have trouble paying their rent. They can't go to the bank because you know how that works. If there's no consistent employment, there's no job security, you can't get a loan. So what is happening? Persons have to choose between, should I pay my light bill, water bill, should I buy food, should I let my children go to school hungry? This mother who I spoke to with the children right now, she said she doesn't know what to do, her head is full, and she said, look, she said she knows of persons, unfortunately, who, because of their situation, single mothers, are getting involved in relationships which can be detrimental to the society. We do not know what they're going, what they're doing in order to put food on the table, so I'm saying, to the employees because it is in your hands right now. The government still has to pass a law. For the employers, it is in your hands right now to stop the abuse of the short-term contract. On January 29, 20, there will be elections. Of course, I am contesting the election also myself as candidate number 13 on, on the list of National Alliance. And I'm saying you have to make the right choice. In closing, let me say this to you. 2019 has been a tremendously difficult year for many of us, myself included. I spent almost two months in Colombia with my wife. She did several operations on St. Martin, and I was flown to, to Colombia and did several operations there also. One lasted six hours. But thank God today I can see she's doing very well. Um, the white and yellow cross that came to our home every day from September the 20th to today said this is the last day. She's doing excellent. I want to thank God for that. And I'm sure there are many of you who had difficult years. But I'm saying to you that in 2020, there is hope. There is hope. Always think positive. I always believe that things can improve. So on behalf of my wife, my family, and myself, I'm saying to all of you, happy new year when it comes. Be strong. Don't get discouraged. Keep your mind focused on positive things. I can tell you, two things are important in life. What you think and what you say. If you think positive and speak positive, then you will be able to work out things. God bless you and enjoy the new year when it comes. Make use of web mobile banking with easy access and direct usage of face recognition. Pin code. Or fingerprint. Download web mobile banking app and make your transaction from anywhere at any time. For more information, visit web-bank.net forward slash quick dash login.
have taken note of um, the statement that was made by the minister. And uh, my first reaction to it, it's rather laughable. And I do not believe that these people are very serious. Because if you are talking about restoring democracy, I think that you cannot um, give democracy in past mail. I think that if you're putting the, restoring the democracy, then you have to restore it fully. And I think it is rather ironic that at this point in time they are talking about restoring democracy because in the first place they indicated that they did not take away the democracy while we were saying that from the very onset. I believe very strongly that if you are restoring democracy, then you must restore the democracy fully. Uh, what I have taken note is that they are talking about having done, um, having this done in three, four to five parts. And I think one of the main um, responsibility, and let's say of the fundamental responsibility of the Island Council is to appoint commissioners on the Executive Council who together with the governor governs the day-to-day -day affairs of the island and also that right to approve the budget. The budget is the right of the Island Council. And what we um, have taken note of is that the intention is that while they um, would allow the public to be able to vote for an island council, the island council will be more a rubber stamp island council because they will have absolutely no power. Um, the two puppets um, that they have appointed some time back mm. will remain here, and they will be the one who are carrying out the whims and will of the Dutch government in Holland. And I think that it's rather unfortunate. And why is it unfortunate? Because the Dutch um, um, state, is a part of the Security Council of the United Nations. And one of the fundamental um, responsibilities of the United Nations is to ensure that there, uh, there is democracy um, in different parts of the world. I mean, they have been um, the, 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 the bastions in promoting um, the democracies and democratic governments. And I find it rather hypocritical and ironic at this point in time that the very same United Nations remain quiet while the, the, the democracy of the people um, was hijacked uh, by the Dutch government, the Dutch state, who is a part of the United Nations. And now they are talking about restoring democracy because of the, 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 the immense criticism that they have received over a period of time. And they are prepared to do this in past mail. It is unacceptable. I believe that the people of station needs to stand up. Hello, St. Martin. My name is Jose Helga and I play basketball. I have organized basketball events in St. Martin. Sport matters to me because it makes everybody come together in unity. So I challenge the businesses community to step up for sports and help us rebuild and repair our facility. I'm also asking the community to nominate local businesses in your area to take on the challenge and step up for sports because sports matter. Check out the Department of Sports SSN Facebook page for more information. Hashtag sport matter, hashtag are you in. The, the business community really supported the, uh, the bingo quite well. And, uh, of course, also, we cannot forget the, the public that came out to really play bingo, you know, and uh, had a great time. I think it uh, was quite a success. I haven't heard anything yet from the committee, uh, you know, about the proceeds, etc. But, of course, it, 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 it was a success, definitely a success, uh, both financially as well as organized. Um, uh, Organisational-wise, it was uh, quite a success, I should say. Are you in a position to say exactly how many tickets were sold for this year's bingo? Mm, not really, because I haven't really inquired anything at all, really, to tell you the truth. You know, um, in my in my condition, uh, you know, I, I I just took it easy, and uh, mm. but well, um, I can say that uh, I guess all the tickets were sold. <laughs> And, of course, proceeds from the bingo will be re-injected yes. into the Committee of St. Martin. Definitely, definitely. We're starting with the youths. We're starting with, uh, you know, uh, our, our campaigns that uh, are there always, uh, you know, the drug awareness, etc. And, um, of course, all the com different community projects which we have, 
because now what is the idea now is that of course the, the various committees uh, will have to submit their budget pertaining to the projects that they would like to execute. We know that in March, for instance, we're going to be having the health and wellness fair, you know, which is going to take quite a dig on, in, the, in, the, in the budget because, um, you know, that is um, totally, totally uh, financed by the fundraising that we've had. You know, it's uh, not supported by anything else. So we have to um, come up with quite some money to organize the health and wellness fair, which we do have, which we always take into consideration. You know, that the health and wellness fair, definitely we have to put aside X, Y, Z, you know, amount of uh, cash to, to be able to organize it. And we're going to be starting soon to invite all the various health organizations, health institutions, you know, to once again take part in the uh, health and wellness fair, to uh, be able to bring to the, the message to the people, you know, to educate, as I always say, to educate our people, not only to test them, but also to educate them in particular pertaining to health care and their own health. So this is very important, and this is a project that definitely we're going to be sponsoring as soon as possible, and usually in the month of March.